Hallelujah. We want to thank God for this year, 2015. It's a good year. If you have not yet seen it, I don't know what to preach to you. Praise the Lord. But 2015 is a good year. Many of you are going to reap what you have not sown. You're going to reap what you have not sown. You remember these days and say, hey, but how come I didn't do this but got this? Praise the Lord. And it's going to be good. It's good when you start reaping why you didn't what? But I didn't sow. Even those things exist in God. Hallelujah. So me, I'm excited for this year. I don't know. There's a way I wanted it to a bit delay. There was a way it's also running. It's already fab. Praise the Lord. I, I just worry that it is running so fast. But anyway, 2016 will also have its own story. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for this evening. We submit to your word. We submit to your power and your authority, God. We're hungry for you, God. We long for you, God. Speak to us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read from the ninth verse to the 10th verse. Thank you. Let's read. Uh-huh. What is let's go? Ah, uh-huh. that's political. Read like Christians. Uh-huh. What is let's go? Mm-hmm. We are bound. Uh-huh. Yet more and more. Uh-huh. In knowledge. Uh-huh. No judgment. Uh-huh. That you may approve things that are excellent. And you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Read in the Amplified. And this I pray, mm-hmm. that your love may abound uh-huh. yet more and more, and extend to its fullest development in knowledge, and all keen insight, that your love may display itself a greater depth of acquaintance and more comprehensive discernment. Next verse. So that may you may surely learn to sense what is vital, and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value recognizing the highest and the best and distinguishing the moral differences, that you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless, so that with hearts sincere and certain and unsullied, you may approach the day of Christ not stumbling, nor causing others to stumble. There is an error that is common and I've seen in the gospel, the dispensation of the New Testament, the present day Christian, the new creation, and it's common among men, but so often ignored because it doesn't look like error. You get it? What makes you a child in the spirit is the way you think, is the way you respond, is the way you, you reason out the things of God. Okay? The Bible says, for when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. You get it? Now, in the scriptures, okay, when you are, there are certain principles where with every Christian who is studying the word must work with if you should grow in the gospel, okay? Like one time I gave you an example of the law of first mention. The first time a certain word is mentioned in the scriptures, it has a certain implication. You should not take it for granted the first time you read the word, a particular word, for example, where the first time the word grace is mentioned in the Old Testament dispensation is when Noah found grace. And you can actually begin from there and reveal Christ in a way unimaginable to the minds of men. You get it? So it is with this. The Bible says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, uh and I stood as a child, And I thought as a child. But when I became a man, the Bible says I put away childish things. Now, between me and you, you cannot speak what you have not understood and you cannot understand what you have not thought. You get it? So even though it's the speaking, understanding, thought, actually the true order of things is I think and therefore I understand and therefore I speak. You get it? So it says, for when I was a child, I speak as a child, the people who speak like spiritual children. And then I understood as a child because you understand as a child. And you 
thought of the child because your thought processes of a child. You get it? You understand? But when the Bible begins with the last instead of first, when it begins with the last things first, eh? therefore it is hope and love. But the greatest of all is love. So if the greatest of all is love, then why isn't love hope and faith? You get it? There's truth there. When words are switched. Usually the one thing, there are probably three or four things about it, but the one imminent thing, when certain things, the first things are put last, usually God seeks to put a certain emphasis on the first things. You get it? Never forget that. There could be two or three reasons why, but the primary reason is that when he says faith, hope, and love, is he wants to stress it, and that is why he put it last. Not necessarily that it was of least importance. That's why he says, but the greatest of all is love. So it is here that there is a place where he, he speaks as a child, understands as a child, and thinks as a child. But he has put the thought last because there is a mind he needs to stress thought. What defines the child is their level of thinking. How do you think? And the way you think equals to how you can understand. You get it? Oh, Lord. Okay, let me give you an example. When we were children, there's a way we interpreted what we saw. You understand? And therefore, certain things were it was just black and white, no gray area. You get where I'm coming from? And therefore, our judgments, our understanding, and our responses to those things was as is. One time we had a maid. And um, for the first time in my life, I'd never seen, you know, well, you, you know you're raised in normal kids. You take milk, you eat bread, what, eggs. So one time she comes and then she sits down with me and says, Grace, I want to give you something so sweet. And I said, what? But the way I'm thinking, sweet, the way I'm thinking how she's looking at me, I'm thinking, eh, oh, what sweet thing are they going to give me? But the face on her, the gleaming on her face, I'm thinking, wow, okay? And then she brings me this very small thing. It was red in color. Then she tells me, eat it. And I put it in my mouth. I felt like somebody had put fire in my mouth. I said, what is this? What? The first bite tells me what maybe it will cool down. I go the second one. My eyes start looking like what I'm eating. I spread it out. The next thing I know, I get water. And when I remove water and then I spit it out, the fire is set again. You understand? I only later realized that it made me eat paper life. Red pepper, live. Life. I said, no, nothing. Like I was chewing it like you chew bubble gum. But my thought life at that particular point could not think. Eh? I could not imagine. One, by reason of ignorance, I didn't know it was red pepper. You get where I'm coming from? But number two, by the way, she said it to me. I could not think that she would do such a thing to me. Now, if I grow up, for example, I know the experience of red pepper. Someone can't bring that silly smile on me and tell me, this is sweet. <laughs> By reason of experience that now I understand how red pepper looks like. You get what I'm trying to tell you? But even if so, maybe there is a place of maturity that can probably now design sarcasm, irony, pretense, and all these things. It's part of growing up. Your mind's adopt. And because your mind's adopt, therefore, of course, everyone has their own speed of thinking, okay? We all have different thought patterns. The way you think is not the way I'm thinking, uh, and, and the other way around, okay? Some people are fast thinkers, some people are slow at thinking. You get it? But as you start to grow up, you also know the difference between the thought patterns, eh? And how much people can adopt, how much people can hold, how much people can process, and how much people can give out. You get it? There are some people who cannot defend themselves when they're in trouble. And there are some people who just know how to defend themselves when they're in trouble. 
not because they are natural lawyers, but their minds can process quickly an answer. You get what I'm trying to tell you? There are things you just can't train a human brain. It's, you're either smart or not smart. You get it? And as you start to also grow, you realize, eh, hey, I think this guy is smarter than me, eh, hey, because of the way he's thinking. There was a time you didn't know who was smarter, or you didn't even care who was smarter, because you could not gauge who is smarter and who isn't, okay? I'm trying to paint a certain picture to you. It will probably bring out what I'm trying to explain here before I go into the depth of it, okay? But bear with me here. But you see, for example, as children are growing up, eh, for those who have been around children or who have children at home, you realize that there's a particular age where the brain starts to adopt certain things. Eh? For example, from the time when the child starts to understand language, eh, then they repeat words, go, go, come, come. You get what I'm trying to tell you? The point where now the brain now can connect and say, now I can speak this word. You tell the child, hallelujah, then say, ayah. Okay, now the brain is trying to connect the hallelujah, but one day they connect. You get where I'm coming from? That's so life. But there was a time that child could think but could not speak. You get it? They think you can do it. Bring that cup, Ruth, and Ruth brings the cup. But Ruth can't say which cup. But there's a time where Ruth gets cognition and then she can speak. And there's that point where she also becomes too inquisitive. You're going where? I still have a niece. Man, she could ask until you get that. So where are you going to town? To do what? With who? How? Who? What time? Oh, so when you're going, will you come back? Yeah, okay, okay. When you come back, will you base? Yeah, okay. Now, when you base, will you respond? Okay, yeah. Okay, now, after you respond, will you come and eat the food? Okay, yeah, okay. That's why you're going to do a TV. Okay, that's why you're going to sleep. Will you sleep? Will you wake up? <laughs> you just put on a, a one stanza mode. Mm, 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 mm. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But then probably as a child is growing up, you start to realize that there are those things expected for a two-year-old to do, expected for a three-year-old to do. The two years, sometimes some of them start adopting a few simple words out of their mouth. They're speaking three-ish. Some of them, if they're smart enough and they're exposed, can even start those who small, small daycare lines of speaking and what, you know, three, four years there, you know. But by the time a child becomes four, they should be able at least to understand the difference between truth and sarcasm. If you're being sarcastic and ironic, a child by the age of four should be able, their brain at least should. For example, those parents used to beat like mine. Eh? You get it? Eh? If a child is going that side, like this, and say, when no gain are you? He ought to understand they are telling him don't go there. <laughs> Who understands what I'm saying? Eh? Yeah? There was an age at two or three. The child could not tell the difference. You tell her, don't go there, Dorona. First, she'll just continue. Dorona, you even call. She's not hearing. No, you're even too boring for her to hear. But there's a point where you get, and you say, you go there, and she can't go. Now, she has understood you actually not saying you go there. But then when a child is that age and they can't tell the difference, then you know you lost your child at a certain stage. Because at that age, you expect that they ought to have understood certain things or have had a certain cognitive process enough to no, they are telling me not to go. They are literally telling me not to go, but they are saying go. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Now, there are people who are even adults, but cannot even understand sarcasm. You get it? Eh? Because their brains also have failed to adopt. They can't even differentiate that. Even when you're joking, for them, they can think you're serious. They even chew wires on you. You get it? Can I go, well, no, on oh, oh, fuck it. You understand? Mva, ko, mva. Before you know it, eh? the guy wants to, run, he wants to fold fists. But really, you were joking. But his brain cannot process that this is a joke. Sometimes not because the joke is bad, no. But because that brain cannot process information to that level. So even as preachers also, when we're preaching, we work with men of different minds. You get it? I can speak certain things and you just, a few minutes, I'm already flipping these ends. You understand? And they go in and out. And you, of course, your brain, some of you can pick. Some of you might not. But it's okay. But of course, as some of you continue to be around, eh, your brains start to... Let's say some of you, when you join the ministry, first, of, first time you heard, you're like, eh, things are too many, they're confusing. But over time, you start to understand. So also, you don't understand who, people who don't understand. You're like, yeah? These things are easy. Why are they complicating them? But even you, know, at the time, you were like that. 
There was also another one who just came first day and they clerk. You get it? You were their kind of preacher. You get it? So even a slow mind can tell you, no, don't speak so fast. You start speaking slowly, such that people understand. But really, it's him saying, he's the one who didn't understand. You get it? If you translate that analogy in the spirit realm, you realize that there are things expected of for every level or dimension that every child of God must enter. You get it? And that is firstly on the things you automatically learn to respond for and the things that automatically respond to you. In um, times of uh, a gentleman called Dowie, how many of you have heard of a gentleman called Alexander Dowie? Alexander Dowie, he was a great minister of the gospel. You know, he's a guy who started violin, you know, he started cities and all. He was a great spiritual authority. The Lord used him greatly. But also that was translated as the times he was persecuted, okay? And if you're an ardent student of revival, for example, you realize that every time persecution stops, usually the revivals die. You're supposed to maintain a certain life where you have to be persecuted up to the end. You might never understand now. The only place that God has to minister to you is the place where you must grow from just being a teacher of the word, a preacher of the word, an apostle, a pastor, and then you become a man of God. Not in the sense of man of God translated as see a prophet. Uh -uh. That has its primary definition. But I'm talking of the definition where you are a man of God by reason of God dealing with you to a certain place of flipping into a world you can never flip back into. There are men who can do miracles, signs and wonders, do all these things and fall back one day. But there are men who... <laughs> it's like in Peter when he says, make your calling and election sure. He says, for if you do this thing, make the ultimate promise, you will never fail. You'll never fall. He said, if you make your calling and election sure, you will never fall. I can be a teacher, but without the affirmations in my spirit enough to make me stand stable in certain circumstances. There are people who just God distributes a simple line of grace for them to stand. But there are things that could shake them one day. And that's why sometimes I mention lines like the test stations of a minister. There are some people who can say, oh, I want to be like Apostle Grace when I grow up. But some of them, they don't really know me personally. They can laugh with me. They can be around and you see their faces. It's true. Some can even assume that because you talk with them a lot, they know you. But you see, they just need to also get into my life and realize there is a lot I've not told anyone. There is a lot I've not told anyone. You get it? There is a lot we can't even preach. Not because we don't want to preach, but some things are too over. Someone can assume they will get them, but they... One time, <laughs> I was preaching. Pastor Isaac is my witness. And a certain guy walked out of the, of the meeting, and his veins came out of the head. His head was almost exploding, as in what he had was too much. <laughs> you get it? There's a place where truth becomes too heavy. <laughs> you get it? I can tell you that there are instances I've preached, huh? and when I come out of that glory of preaching, I can lose like strength for hours. Not because I am sick, no. But because the weight under which I was functioning was too heavy for the human body. You get it? It was too heavy for the human body. That if it, I go past that level to probably make that person understand a certain depth, they might even run mad. That's why sometimes you can preach the gospel. And then you see people respond in a certain way. They are not under the power of God, no. But their bodies and brains, their brains have failed to sustain a certain depth. You get where I'm coming from? That's why there are some people in the gospel, not only here, but in other ministries, where you see somebody can get into the gospel and run mad. Like genuine madness. They are not under the power of the Holy Spirit. Nada, no. But they were just too unstable to receive certain illumination. 
some illuminations by the gospel that the eyes of your understanding will be illuminated will be flooded with light some lights came to unstable souls and at that particular point they could not hold the depths of truth you can actually judge certain men by thinking that they know only what they speak until you realize that sometimes there's a maturity that must sway the spirits of men to know how much they can take in but again not spoil them enough to tell them stuff they ought to have known the church lived at a certain place just below the bar they lived for so long the church lived at a place where it was teaching a p6 kid p3 stuff you get it it's like a friend of mine had a little child and then his child was one of you know was a good performer no and this guy was in like p6 and then there's a certain system that they wanted to enroll this child to it's like the equivalence of cambridge but it's not cambridge really it's like what do you call it uce sce something like that I think it's ACE, eh? Yeah? ACE, yeah. So they get this kid into the ACE thing, and I visited the school. I saw how they do their things. They study their things in paces, you know. If a child can get 70, perhaps percent and more, they can do, for example, a child is mandated to do a particular number of paces every time, but if a child's brain is faster, they can do more paces quicker. But the SE thing has a Christian mind to it. Eh? It says that the child comes with a holistic mind of, yes, I'm a scientist, but in a godly perspective. And that's why it presented that kind of mind. And, of course, it's being accepted in different places and countries. Even Makere can actually enroll kids from SEE. So um, it's a training process. It's something I would, you know, look through and say, instead of a child having these funny educations you guys have, I would want my child to have that kind of education where they study in places and they can study faster. So they can graduate faster. They can even have master's degrees at a very young age, depending on how fast their brain can. So the child is not also slowed by the teacher. You get what I'm trying to tell you? The teacher is determining how fast your child will move, but sometimes your child can know more than the teacher thinks your child knows. So I want the child to also have the opportunity to move faster ahead of their own peers, to move at how fast their brains can adopt and mutate this whole education system. So they get these kids, they put them under a small examination and test to see how much they know. Now this P6 kid had to be thrown back to P4, SEE. You get where I'm coming from? So meaning that the education system available at that particular point, even though could present a very good P6 kid, according to the SEE, he was two years behind. And that's what education did to us. You get it? Because of the form of education that we carried, you realize, for example, um, many people learned reading in the P5, P4. You get what I'm trying to tell you? Some are in university, they still have trouble reading. You give him, <laughs> I was sharing a gospel, so I opened something for, for somebody, and I gave him Isaiah 53, verse 5 to read. And then when the person got to the chastisement of our peace, ma kasa kasa, and the chispecho, of our peace, that one, the chastisement was, I said, oh my God, you're more than 35, you don't know the word chastisement. But I don't blame them, okay? What age did they learn to read? Huh? What age did they learn to read? Some of you, even if you go back now to your thing, you realize also the age you learned to read, there was trouble. Some of you, even the English came a bit older. When you were young, you had trouble. You get it? it expressing yourself in English was a hard paper. Because there's a, some of you, it has even stayed. You're old, but sometimes some words come out. Yeah, some things just stop. <laughs> then you say, oh, but is it me really? Well, okay. <laughs> The process under which you had education could not provide for a certain way for you to think outside a certain box, okay? And that is why lately education is changing its form. The other day I was with my nieces and because sometimes I would, you know, want to help the young kids in, you know, homework and all. So sometimes I take some time to know, you know, I want to study the books of my nieces. I get through, read, understand their lines of adoption i realize okay now they're teaching them too much for their age if i can remember my primary so you know sometimes i also go back through those small things i can i'm the kind of find a, 
a, a senior kid reading Copperfield, David Copperfield, and I want to go back and read, just go through a few pages of David Copperfield just to remember, okay, what was this guy about, you know? So you get to lose these kids, and then you tell him, spell constitution. Then he says, oh. And I'm like, I'm like, the, you know what? C, it was C. Who told you that it is? Mm. They even have sounds like. Mm. I'm like, okay. So since when did mm come in? You get it? Because me, I knew my vowels R A E O U O R. You get it? It's what makes you dot comish. It's what puts a bit sense. You get it? And that's why everything fascinated us. You get it? So even this primary kids, the way they understand the vowels is not the way we understand the vowels, our yas. You remember? So the way we say a, a, e, o, it's, it's, for them there is the way they say it. It's different. Who understands what I'm saying? But for us, that was the primary line of speech. Huh? When they were teaching you to, 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 to read and write, they say a, a, e, Oh, woo. but some of us were in Nakasera, they used to say, oh, ah. Yeah, you remember? Eh? Of course not, not you. <laughs> so, of course, there's that capacitization, you understand, you're also attached to that kind of education. To you, it's a bit, it's all you know, you get it, it's your beginning language. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a place where we, like it is, that the SE kid was two years ahead of the UPE kid, eh? huh? in the sense of that this guy is in P6, he's ahead. But the SE kid in P4 and is behind. But really, in the real life, the SE kid is ahead because he's in a genuine class 4. And this one is in a class 6 that is not genuine. Of course, you celebrate where we come from. There was a time many people wanted to get it. So we say, okay, thank God that at least there's education in our nation. You know, universal lines, doesn't matter how kids expect them. At least it's important that kids are going to school. We also bless the Lord. But translate that in the same thing as the spirit realm. You find a preacher who has gone so up there. And when you listen to him, you actually realize he's a P3 kid. And then you find another man, he's not even anywhere near that guy. He's even believing God for a meal. When you talk to the guy, he has notes of P7. He's even passing it, he's going to S1. You get it? Then there's that point of translation from the time where the guy who is in P7 by the real mind has to have the things the guy who is a P3 chap has. So you also realize that even though the P3 chap has all these things, and the P7 chap doesn't, okay, has a certain line of motive, the guy who P7 mind has, who understands what I'm saying? Fast forward, okay. So the guy in P3, for example, he knows little, but he does much. The guy in P7 knows much, but he's doing little. Between these two, what defines the two guys and their ministry is called the opportunity and experiences. Because he might be a P3 chap, but he has opportunities and experiences of a P7. And he might be a P7 chap, but does not have the opportunities and experiences of a P3. So now that makes learning a bit more wider than you think. So learning goes past head knowledge and starts to go through the experiences and opportunities that are either provided for or you provide for yourself by reason of how you learn to work with God. You get where I'm coming from? If you go to Malaysia and then you look at Hong Kong, you look at two different churches. Hong Kong, many of the guys, they are too bleak about the Bible that you can share and say, for this reason was the Son of God brought that he might destroy the works of the devil. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they get slain. It is too deep. <laughs> Before you even explain it, they are slain on the ground. Because for them, everything is deep. 
They took too long to make up a mind to get the Bible in their head. They were not really a reading culture in the lines of the Bible. So they don't have much knowledge, but they pray a lot. You get where I'm coming from? They do what? They pray a lot. So they have the understanding of revival defined in their own way. They can find and say, revival is happening. This one is born again. Two years now. And they're selling a God, a small God. So that's their definition of salvation. You get it? Now, you go to Malaysia. You find a pastor. You speak Ephesians chapter 2. He speaks the whole chapter. You speak Matthew chapter 7. He speaks the whole chapter. Takes you to the commentary of Matthew Henry. Takes you to James. Takes you to the interlinear. The original Greek and Hebrew translations. Takes you to the two lines. Compares the two commentaries. Goes back to the original root word. Explains it from the root lines of the archaic Greek and the modern Greek. You get it? And then, you bring a guy with flu. And he can't pray for you. Who understands what I'm saying? Ask the guy, do you speak in tongues? He says, tongues, no. But I want to pray for me. You get it? Yeah? So like, this guy was splitting atoms a few minutes ago with the dispensations of the depth of the Holy Ghost. And for me, that's why I want to keep myself in check. I don't want to know too much not to experience God. I don't want to experience God too much not to know him. The fact that you walk with Apostle Grace every time you think you actually understand him. Then one day you're shocked that you actually didn't. You get it? Familiarity, what? Bridge content. But I've seen men of the Spirit have the same familiarity of the spiritual things. Now, for some, it's because uh, they've been there to a certain depth. But to others, it's because they don't actually even understand it. I mean, if a guy has just done a few small exploits in the spirit and it's enough for him to have a certain boasting, you get it? You find a pastor with 20 members, but he also has bodyguards. No. <laughs> 20 members. And you ask him why he says, no, the security of the man of God is key. You get what I'm trying to tell you? 20 members. Now, that's a familiarity. Yes, it's true. But also, it also spells a certain inexcusable ignorance. One, there are men which might need security. Even though, to those again, we still have a certain message to explain to them to help them walk out of that mind. You get it? But, you might understand sometimes. You get it? Benny Hinn can get in a place and the stampede to see him, you will, you will definitely need security. You get it? Because the multitudes are thronging to him. You get it? Even your Lord at a particular point, you, nobody could just get through and touch him. There was men thronging around him. You get it? But they were not there with the mindset of protecting him from haters who might shoot him through a long-range sniper gun, okay? That's also another understanding. You get it? But the guy who has 20 members, and his head tells him he's too important. Okay, over he's walking in faith, but also it's also in his faith. You get it? Because if it is faith, I'd rather raise more dead men, that the bodyguard thing will work, eh? Who understands what I'm saying? So how can you have 20 members, but you also want a certain line of bodyguards? You get it? It has also created a certain deception in the body of Christ. You get it? Like you see people who didn't go to school. Huh? Do you know people who didn't go to school have the best signatures? They want to provide for a certain opportunity for you not to think that they didn't go. So they must complicate something. Make a signature. You think he has finished? <laughs> as you're taking it. <laughs> I 
The guy I know, he didn't go to school, but when you look at the guy's signature, you'd think he's the governor <laughs> of Uganda or something. He probably holds the signature to the treasury box of some, some hidden underground investment project. You understand? But he's really trying to provide for a certain place of you saying, ah, you know, don't say to your Yeah, so much. That's the deception you see with lawyers every day in suits. If you're a lawyer, I'm sorry. No hate, really. Everyone who has a suit, you think he's smart. What? Some of them are working with past degrees that he takes, but what? Suit, <laughs> you The suit is psyching. You get on and tell you. The, the suit, you look at the suit and say, hey man, smart lawyer. Comes his hair, brushes his shoes, holds a very nice bag. And he walks with very nice English and you say, my God, this guy must be smart. So got to results, no gamba. Hey, now his item is suit in a zikuba. <laughs> Who understands what I'm saying? That deception is also in charge. A certain man of God puts on a certain suit, a very special tie, and a long thing, it is silver, and he says, praise God. <laughs> and then you say, oh my God, I think this guy is going to kill me. You see Pastor Nixon, you think, ah, this one I think is, because let me start with his own stuff. He says, now today, God, God is going to make you happy. And then you say, yeah, now this man, even his English is not American. <laughs> then another guy says, praise God. Praise God. <laughs> the guy didn't go to school. But on top of that, he didn't even want to first master Ugandan English. No. He wants to jump to American English. So it's broken, but it's American, baby. Yeah. That's the man I got. Who understands what I'm saying? But well, you didn't come to laugh by that. I'm making a very sensitive point. So some of you might be laughing. Me, I'm making a very, very, very deep thing, by the way. Very deep. So I also don't want to lose you in the jazz. Eh? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If I was that kind of man and never had that education, I would first want to understand the Ugandan one. You get it? You understand? So now we have a certain outward experience of what we define as glory, yet it's not really glory. It is something anybody outside can have. Now, because the world is changing and a lot of things have happened over the years, some people have reached a point where now they can't... You know this generation, eh? You know? It's living in the fulfillment of Scripture that in the last days knowledge shall increase. Knowledge shall increase means that there is a prevenient grace that is providing, might not be directly, but deliberately, a grace for men to understand things simply. You get it? That's why I realize that some men who are in their primary years of understanding, of, sorry, age, still find guys who are just beginning the gospel. And anger the guys of the gospel are crazy. If I'm young guys, they're just sharp from campus, but a guy can articulate the word and you say, hey, where did this guy come from? He can throw it in mystery. You get it? But anyway, translated, knowledge is increasing. Therefore, we can't settle for certain things. We're not proud. No, we just know what we want. You either have it or you don't have it. Now, those days of which the man of God who has to know have also come to an end. There are guys who sit and you think they don't know until one day a guy speaks and you say, hey, Kumbe, the guy who sat, used to sit in the meeting, actually knew too much. Yes, he just knew too much to be humble. You get it? And then you find a guy who doesn't know anything and he can't sit. It also becomes your problem. A guy comes in a conference, speaks for 15 minutes. He says, hey, I wish he even knew just a half of what I know. And after the guy excuses himself because he thinks he knows too much for, to be taught. <laughs> who understands what I'm saying? Now, of course, we are moving at a point where some of these guys are going to start waking up. They are starting to wake up. They are starting to wake up. Why? Because what they know is still not validating them. What they claim to know can't be proved. Now, there's a thing up there. I have a sermon soon. I'll preach somewhere. Not here. Here, you might stone me. But there's something changing. Eh? Some of you have said sensing it. Eh? There's something changing there. That's why some of you, when you go to some churches and you listen, mm, things fail. Not because you're proud. No. 
You just don't understand some people anymore. They are on a certain plane. And you so so look back and say, eh, Kali, this was deep to me one time. Yes, it was. There was a time your body could even feel chills on it when they had. But now, you hear those things and say, eh, na ya, do, do you know that some of you now, you can hear your pastors and know that the pastors light. <laughs> but you don't want to tell him the truth. And you know, eh, it's my pastor here. Yeah. <laughs> no. In Jeremiah it says this, I read it, I might not know. Even the even people who are even too plain as they might not know where the scripture is. But in their hearts they know that the scripture doesn't say these things. Yet there was a time where even if they lied to you and they put you on a roller coaster for you waiting for the anointing. People are speaking but you're saying, God, I, I pray they do first what to the point where you say, everybody put up your hands, and you go, <laughs> there's the moment I've been waiting for. But now those things have changed, have changed, sorry. We want God. So the learnings are not only in the scriptures, but they should be also experienced, and the opportunities that should come in our lives. We can abuse them, provide for them or not, but it's expedient that every man now starts to, and that now that's the warning I send to you all, listening to me. Let's stop playing in the things of the gospel. Let's become a bit more serious. Why? Because what is coming to us in these last days, it's too heavy, but it will fall on any man who wants it. Some things were not far from you, no. You just never gave yourself to them. So, ah, how did you learn the gospel? Da, da, da. Very simple. I was hungry. But even me, I'm hungry. You don't understand. Your definition of hunger is not mine. Your understanding of prayer is not my understanding of prayer. You get it? You understand where I'm from? That sometimes, of course, isn't that where well, 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 you have to say, okay, okay, cool, you pray, but don't show it this way, because they might make it a standard and still fail to define what they want before God, because they think that's the standard of definition. You get what I'm trying to tell you? But no man hungers for righteousness. And they're not what? Field. No man hungers to know and they don't know. No man hungers to experience and they don't experience. It does not exist in God. You might think that, that's, yes, of course, there are those people God can set before you by any years and then he gives them a grace because he needs to establish something, yes. But even in the place of establishment, there's a grace for the man who has sat under that thing to adopt. You get it? Now, like I was explaining the thing of the kids, physical, there are people which are like that in the spiritual. Their thought life, already, the, where they are in thought, when you start to explain certain things, they understand them differently, and they speak them differently. They manifest them differently. They respond to them differently. They communicate them differently. Because the level at which we are defining thought, the thought process of this Christian, the foundation of it, was not the true foundation where we, the person, had to start thinking from in the spirit. You get it? Like, you realize that sometimes kids who are not well breastfed, they always have issues, eh? You get it? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Kid is just born, they could make our milk on the kid. You get it? Of course, they, the kid might not think like a cow, but, but, there's a reason why God gave the woman a breast to feed her child. If you have that simplest wisdom, let the woman breastfeed her child. Or oh, woman, breastfeed your child. You get what I'm trying to tell you? There's a reason why in the primary roles, God didn't give the man a breast. So even if you speak gender equality, I don't have what? Breast. We can have depreciation of roles and law. And those roles can define also the place where we're supposed to be. Now, you might refuse it because you know too much law. The very reason why lawyers are not married, by the way, I have an issue on that. Eh? But that will be one time. I have a retreat there in LDC. I've made notes there. Ah, yeah, yeah. By the way, I have a someone called Strange Women. Eh? I'll preach it in this Virtuous Women Conference one of these days. Oh, oh, oh Strange Women. Oh, I, I've started them since November last year. I have my notes there, so I look like this and I understand strangeness. I have my understanding of strange women here. 
Uh, even the notes are here, I can open for you and show you strange women. Some people read strange women in the book of Proverbs and they don't really understand it. Oh, oh, oh I got notes. And I realized, eh, some people married strange women. Okay, that's for another day. <laughs> Hallelujah. So at the end of the day, for example, we expect that when a child, at least let a child breastfeed, at least up to about one year and eight months, at least, or six or five, you get it? That's women, correct me. Two years, me, I, I, for my, okay, well, where I was raised, it was two years and more. Okay, two years, really. But some, some women, eight months, whoosh, they pull their kid off. You know? <laughs> Kids still want, whoosh, you get, they just detach. You get it? So, of course, there are those things that you expect a child to be doing. For example, the child's body, huh? when you've just produced a child, huh? you put them under a warm, because they've switched the world. You get it? It's amazing. Yeah? That some of you who know science, eh? you've heard of things they call water baths. Huh? A woman can produce a child in a bathtub full of water. Eh? And they go through the whole process of producing the child. And that child can stay in that water for minutes and they can die. You get it? Yet for you, the moment they throw in water, you, you breathe in and what pack? Or you drink and get full. But imagine the place where the human body can live in water for minutes. Why? Because it has spent nine months without accessing oxygen through the nose. The lungs don't know how to live in the other world. It's also an adaptation process. In its own, it's a teaching to breathe. You get where I'm coming from? It's a teaching to breathe. Because these are two different worlds. When that child is in the womb, there is a way that child understands. It's, they're not, they don't understand that they're in the womb, no. They just have this one understanding. It's their world. No child comes out by peace. No child comes out happy. Kids don't smile when they're producing them. Kid comes and says, yo, yo, what's up, man? I missed you, man. What up? No. It's trouble. You get it? But there's a process that makes this kid outgrow the womb. You get it? There's a process that makes this kid do what? That process. That process. It makes the mother uncomfortable, does all these kinds of things to the mother. But you see, what is really happening is there is a life in there that has become uncomfortable. But it's not uncomfortable because it thinks it's uncomfortable. It is just uncomfortable because nature has provided that it can't stay in the womb for nine months. Do you understand where I'm coming from? There is a place where a man is discomforted by knowledge. And there's a man who becomes discomforted by nature. We expect that having spent this long in the gospel, you must have known certain things. Then there are those ones which just start to grow in a certain way by reason of their calling. You get it? That's why some people, when you look at them, they think more than their age. You get what I'm going to tell you? Their brains are more mature than their, their age. The way they are thinking, they think 60, but they are really like 22 or 23, even in the re lines of, of talk. Eh? Today I intercepted a girl, she's about 25. Man, the girl was speaking, but I was looking like a 45-year-old like a girl. She's 25, but she was thinking like a 45-year-old girl. I was, and you know, when I sit around such people, I don't want them to stop talking. You get this the amusement that you're speaking all the stuff than your age. I just love it. You get it? But I realize, okay, there are girls which are 29, but they're thinking like, oh, wow. 20? But it's worse with men, so don't worry. You have consolation. <laughs> men, we are worse. So why? Pray for us. We are worse. I don't know why. You get what I'm trying to tell you? So this child starts to try to want to feed I mean, stops to fit in that world. Not because they're thinking, 
Not because they've been Simanya, inspired by a special word of God. Simanya, the man of God, preached deep things. No. Simanya revival, the spirit came on me and I started. No. Entirely, growth process has provided that this body will start to grow. The bones will form up, everything. And the nine months are going to reach. And they come into a world they don't understand. It's when you realize whether they were deaf, it's when you realize whether they were dumb, it's when you realize that they were born blind, it's when you realize that they were born with defects. But when they were still in the womb, they couldn't know they were blind. You get it? At that level, the child couldn't know it was blind. Because in that world, it didn't need to open its eyes to see, it didn't need to open its ears to hear, it didn't need to open its mouth to speak, it didn't need to open its, you know, anything about it. You get it? But as it starts to come out, you realize, my child is not seeing. When you do this, my child is not responding. Oh, oh, they were deaf. Now, in the level when they were still in the womb, they were children. You get it? They were defects that did not have consequence. She was blind, but it was okay. She didn't need to see. She was deaf, but it was okay. She didn't have no one to hear. But now she has entered the world where she must hear. She has entered the world. Oh, he has entered the world. Why? He must see. Because in that world, if you don't see, you can't move. If you don't hear, you can't resonate. Communication becomes a bit harder. In this world, communication is different than the communication here. Communication here is food. And but communication in the other world, the way you adopt to things must and will be different. Now, those defects, if they come in this world, the person starts to look like they are special. They are invalid. They are disabled. But in their mother's womb, they were not disabled. Because it didn't make a difference whether they were blind or not. So in any case, if you ask them, are you enabled? They will say, I'm fully enabled. You get it? But in this world, the defects are said to happen. Same thing with the spirit realm. In the spirit realm, when you've just gone and again, there are things which are okay. But as you continue to grow in God, you realize that these are more realms in the spirit. These are more realms in the spirit. I was giving the example of Alexander Dewey. Though I can always come back, I remember. Men persecuted the guy, they did all these kinds of things to him. Da, 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 da. They stayed preaching, stay preaching, stay preaching, stay preaching. He was arrested probably more than a hundred times. He still stayed preaching. One day in his old age, he's seated in his office, he's writing notes. And he hears the voice of God tell him, get out of your office. He ignores it. Second time, he says, get out of your office. Though he gets out of the office. And just two or three minutes after the walk outside his office, he realized that there was a dynamite planted under the exact chair he was seated and it blew up. You get it? At that level of maturity, whether he was a prophet or he wasn't, dynamite should not and must not be have the ability to kill that kind of man. Because we expect that he has matured to a certain age to discern that there's dynamite under my chair. Whether I'm a prophet or not, I have matured enough to see and hear. Whether I feel it or I don't feel it, something should cause me, at least I should feel like going to the loose and go to the toilet for a short call and the dynamite pulls off. But there must be something, even if I don't hear, there should be a certain force in the spirit to propel me out of that chair. Even if it's saying, for some, he might not hear the voice. At least his body will create a natural call and he will want to go for a short call. But either way, the bomb can't kill that kind of man. Now, there are men who reach that level in ministry and the bombs kill them. You understand? And the bombs do what? Kill them. What did we miss in the picture there? What did I miss there? You get what I'm trying to tell you? It means in my growth process, there are things that I didn't adopt and I should have. And they expect me to be at a certain maturity in life. 
You get where I'm coming from? Now, when he says that you may abound more in love, but a love which is in knowledge, you get what I'm trying to tell you? Even when we define the love of God that passes all understanding, we can only have a love that may abound yet more and more in the knowledge and in all judgment. It's no longer that I am preaching or I'm seeking out. I'm not coming anymore to Afroston because I don't have pulpits. Understand me. I do. I'm no longer preaching to Afroston. If there are things, stories are written, they have already written. They've been written somewhere on these, these grounds in Makiri. Somewhere there's like a place where someone will remember something. You get it? We've seen God. Likewise, I don't expect you to come now because you are submitted to a first stone or because your pastor is preaching or because Simanya the Papa is your friend or because you had a breather after work or because you are not tired. But you are tired, you would not have come. You get it? I prayed the whole day. I prayed in the evening with people who came from prayer. I'm preaching now. After now, I'm going for a drive to pray for another one hour. You get what I'm trying to tell you? You think I don't get funny also? No, I can't. But you see, I've gone to a point where now my body can't rule me in a certain way. Why? Because I can't speak of a love and a bound in a certain love that is not after seeking a certain knowledge. There are things I need to know in God. I don't want to come out of salvation so rich with everything money can buy but without the substance of knowledge it's those things Paul counts loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ and he says and yeah and all those things have counted nothing but dang but that I may win Christ that I may fellowship in his suffering conform to his death and that I will see resurrection power in my life so the power to resurrect not only people, but everything around you starts to get life. You start to minister life. Why? Because you're not moving in a place of just love. You're moving in a place of love that abides in knowledge. Then the next verse in the 10th verse says that you may be able to prove, to examine, to, 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 to give a go ahead or refuse the things which are excellent. And that's the point where now God starts to, to use you to prove what's true and what isn't. Not necessarily by attacking men of God and preaching what they don't preach or against what they're preaching. But by necessarily speaking and ministering the truth as it is from God. Men can differentiate and know that this is head knowledge and this is Rema from a man who has experienced God. You see, we have men who, who, have, who are like news reporters of heaven. You get it? A man can hear one pastor preach and then he builds a ministry entirely on what the pastor has preached. It's not bad to quote your spiritual authority. It's not bad. No, in fact, it's good if you're a student. You get it? But it's another if you have not experienced what you're quoting. So some men look like they're just reporting speeches of some devotionals, some DVDs, some tips. Some Bible school sermons and, and lectures. Until the gospel now starts to become a life experience. That even when you're quoting from the devotional, the life of Christ will be shed out of those black and white things to manifestation. You get it? Let alone also refusing <laughs> to quote and then you run wild in a certain life that can't even define you anymore. You get it? <laughs> because you unsubmitted. That's another thing. Okay? But I want to finish with this. Then it says that you might approve all things that are excellent. The things which are excellent. That means you are at a place where if any man would want to define excellence, it can come out of your spirit. And if it should come from everywhere else, you have a place that can judge that matter because you are bound in all knowledge and in all judgment. When a man learns that, you actually realize that sometimes our most primary error is when we miss the things up. And to the day of Christ, we are demanded a certain line of accountability that we can't give. 
because we didn't know that we, we account in knowledge. Now, the guy tells you that you might be <laughs> sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. It's also another place of offense if you don't take time to really know God and grow in love, abounding entirely in all knowledge and judgment. What I'm trying to say is, there is judgment for men who don't know. Speak something to God. Just say something. Whatever you want to tell him, you tell him. Father God, we need to know you. We need to know you, God. We need to experience you, God. We need to walk in your love. We need to walk in a love that is after knowledge. We need to know you, God. We do not want to have offense on the day of Christ by reason of ignorance. For you have told us that men die because they lack knowledge. God give us knowledge. Give everybody knowledge. Give understanding to the simple God. Give wisdom to whoever asks tonight, God. I pray that for that person who says, I've not been understanding the word, I've tried to read the word, I've failed, I'm, I'm trying, but I can't. I pray right now for the grace for you to understand the word for the grace for you to interpret the scriptures and for the consequent experiences that come with knowledge. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. God bless you.